welcome to um yeah we have ourselves on recording now so good morning and welcome to the second half of our unit 10 which deals with informal fallacies part two okay we've seen why we call them informal fallacies and not formal fallacies you have to have a fresh revision of that We have seen the three categorizations we can have of informal fallacies, fallacies of relevance, fallacies of weak induction, and then fallacies that manipulate, if you like, language or data. And we've seen quite a number of examples of particular specific fallacies. We are now building on to this, to the next half. On our screen, we see Appeal to unqualified authority, argumentum ad verkundiem, or illegitimate appeal to authority. The appeal is an illegitimate one. You are appealing to an authority, but it is not a legitimate authority you are appealing to. Why? So an authority is an expert, someone who is qualified in a certain field, but you are appealing to that person's view or perspective on a matter that he or she is not an expert in. He's an expert, but not in the field being discussed. As, as simple as that. And so that is what makes that appeal an unqualified one. You may be talking about uh, crop animals, farm stuff. Okay, so crops, animals, and how we have to apply fertilizer or add you know, something to the meal of the animals for them. So it's an agricultural thing. You may be discussing that. And then for you to ground your evidence, you want to say that, oh, the reason why we must put so and so and so manure into the soil is because the military boss of or the aide camp of the president or something like that said so. A person may be an authority, but not in what you are discussing. So when you appeal to such an authority to ground the claim you are making, we will think of that as what? Appealing to an unqualified authority, appeal to illegitimate authority. An example on our screen brings it home. Let's have one of you read quickly. Anyone wants to read that quickly? Chris, go ahead. You are muted, oh, Prisla. Example one. Mm -hmm. Our pastor says that prayer in public schools is unconstitutional. Therefore, we must conclu conclude that such prayer is perfectly legal. Example so the pastor two. says prayer in public schools is not unconstitutional. The pastor is an authority but an authority in religious matters, faith matters, not an authority in constitutional matters or legality. Law and constitution is for lawyers or people who know the law and are authorities in it. You, see, you may know the law, but not be an authority in it for you to go and administer it. Okay. So someone may know drugs. They may know that oh, this antibiotic is good, but he's not an authority. He's not authorized to. So you don't appeal to someone who is an authority in another field to ground claims that are being made in that the, uh, in another field that he is not an expert in. It's as simple as that. When you do that, you are appealing to an unqualified authority. The same thing is happening with the Prof. Blizzard Drew example there. He is a highly respected entomologist. He studies insects entomologist okay he has sat in a place of authority like being a vice chancellor he would have met big people or whatever so his status and his authority is big up there but when we want to discuss coronavirus look on the screen he recommended chlor chloroquine for the treatment of coronavirus he said therefore chloroquine should be used to treat the coronavirus that is unqualified authority you have appealed to it's a fallacy that is the problem we have with that kind of reasoning where 
you are appealing to an authority to ground a claim be made, but the authority is not a qualified one. The next fallacy you want to add to what we've seen so far will be what hasty generalization. That's also a fallacy of weak induction. Small evidence, you want it to do so much for you, it doesn't have the capacity to do what you expect of it. Remember, fallacy. So this is part two. So just in case you were not in, engaged in the part one, you haven't bothered to look at the recording for that. It's a clue for this, this recording is continuing part, the part one on informal fallacies. I've loaded that on my channel. Also on the, I've shared the links on, on the platforms that I engage directly. Okay. So what? So hasty generalization is also called jumping to a conclusion. Look at the name. You are in a hurry to generalize. You are in a haste, open term. You know, you are in a haste to generalize. Hasty generalization occurs when out of few instances, few, you make a general claim about the whole set just because you know something about a subset of that group. Please read for me, my lady, Priscilla. Example two makes the point strongly. So read that one, please. The actual Jack Yapia, the journalist Abe Kusantana, and the influential man of God, Pastor Utabel, have all endorsed Mahama for president in the 2020 elections. I think that settles it. Every famous person intends to vote for Mahama. Can you see the fallacy there? Yes. The person has three instances of famous people who say Mahama for president. This is before 2020, so you can tell it's not a recent thing. But even if it were true that those three people said so, look at the conclusion that the author is making. Therefore, every, every fame or BRC, every famous person intends to vote for Mahama. What is your reason for saying that? Oh, but uh, that your peer said so. Even Abiku Santana too, and then Pastor Mensah Otabu to say all of them are for GDM. Therefore, every every famous person intends to. That's a hasty generalization. Here there is evidence, okay, of people who have said yes for Mahama, but it's not enough grounds to. Therefore, claim. Look at what you want this evidence to do. You want the evidence to be the ground for your claiming that every famous that the evidence can do that. It's like asking the three-year-old boy to push the car out of the compound, a big car, not the baby car. Push it out. How? <laughs> he's, he's a human being, but he doesn't have the capacity to. So when the premises are insufficient, and you, you use it to draw a an overly generalized conclusion will say you are in a haste to generalize, you are in a hurry to generalize, hasty generalization, or jumping to conclusion. There are so many. Our first, on our first date, I'm reading example three now. Richie had his hands all over me, and I found it nearly impossible to keep him in his place. A week ago, John gave me that stupid line about how, in order to prove my love, I had to spend the night with him. Men are all alike. All any of them wants is sex. The hasty generalization in that case, in the fact that from two experiences you've had with Richie and John, you draw a conclusion about oh man, that's hasty generalization. Any questions? We've done two of them. We've done hasty generalization just moments ago and earlier. We looked at appealing to unqualified authority. We had last week we saw all the others. I don't think we should repeat it here. If you want to revise, you just pick that and play back. You have an advantage if it were in-person lecture. That lecture would have gone. You can't access it again. But thankfully, you have you have recorded them. So they are there for those who may want to, rec uh, to revise the previous six informal fallacies we did. Okay. But the second half, we have done two now. Now we go to the third one. The third one called misplaced vividness. It is like hasty generalization. It's a variant of hasty generalization. So you are moving from few instances to talk about the whole, the general. Okay. However, you are, you are not just moving. It is as a result of a certain experience, often emotional one, not pleasant, 
most of the time, but it could also be out of an extremely pleasant experience. Either way, eh, that you had about that situation, those few instances is what is making you overly dramatically draw a conclusion. Okay, so the conclusion is general, yes, based on some insufficient evidence. Why wouldn't we call it hist just hasty generalization? Well, because this one has an additional feature to it. That additional feature is there is a certain emotional impact of a kind that is associated with that small instance. That is what is making you overly dramatize, you know, the generalization. Okay. So it 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 deflects attention. It's one of the things that takes your attention from the actual issue. Why? Because you are not just telling the person. Uh, uh, what you know based on the few instances. That would have been hasty generalization. This one, it is as a result of an impact. The thing had an impact. Either you know someone who was affected by that thing so much so that you think that any other person that comes near that thing will have the same effect. From one or two instances, you are generalizing. These one or two instances had an emotional impact on you which is the source of that generalization. That's why we say the emphasis, the vividness, you, have, you are emphasizing something, but that emphasis is misplaced. It's out of the pain you feel, and not so much about the insufficient evidence there. Let's see some examples. I am giving up extreme sports now because I have children, now that I have children. I think I will take up golf. This is Anne speaking. I'm stopping all these extreme sports I used to do running, maybe playing football, what have you. I'm a lady, I think, now I want to take something milder so that I don't overwork myself because I've started giving uh, giving birth to children. And my system will not accommodate such extreme, you know, strenuous sport. Then Bill says, I wouldn't do that. So it is to tell you that I wouldn't go for golf. No, look at the reason. Then he says, do you remember Charles? <laughs> He was playing golf when he got hit by a golf cart. It broke his leg and he fell over, giving him a concussion. He was in hospital for a week and still walks with a limp. I would stick to my paragliding. You see, one person, Charles, and the effect golf had on Charles, not even golf itself, an accident that okay. You see, that's for golf. I won't go, I will not go and do golf because of this event that happened. What about the thousands other people of other people that have played golf without any accident? You are generalizing in a haste, but we won't call this just hasty generalization because the the hasty generalization is arising from what an emotional impact, some unpleasant something. In this instance, eh, that happened to a friend who is who has been caught in the trap of golfing. And because of that, which has even led to his limping or whatever, you think that he has a golf game. You shouldn't go and play golf. It can lead to you getting a, a, a broken limp. You know, that's the second one. Sister, read this one for me. Read it very well eh, so that the point will come out clearly. We move on. Priscilla, read for me, please. I have been thinking, Jane, I have been thinking about getting a new laptop. What sort, what sort of laptop do you want to get? Well, it has to be easy to use, have a low price, and have decent processing power. I've been thinking about getting an L, RLG laptop. I, I read in that consumer magazine that they have been found to be very reliable in six independent industry studies. I wouldn't get that RLG laptop. A friend, a friend of mine bought one a month ago to finish his master's, his master's thesis. He was halfway thesis. through. Thesis. That is thesis. Yeah, right. Thesis. He was halfway through it when smoke started pouring out of the CPU. He didn't get his thesis done on time and he lost his financial aid. Now he's selling both fruits on the streets. Hey, I guess I won't go with that RLG laptop thing. <laughs> okay, so you can see from that one instance of that friend, that friend to the demons following him, I welcome. Hey, 
he couldn't finish his so he says a friend of mine bought one a month ago which one this is someone trying to prevent jane from getting an rlg laptop jane says i am looking for a laptop that has a decent processing power power to process quickly speed up because of this online stuff okay i want one that has a power that i can stay outside and use it for a while without a plug so it has to have a lasting and i i think that and the price too should be you know low price i'm a student i don't want to have to buy uh, you know an expensive laptop it's even risky for me someone will steal it easily then i've seen in the consumer magazine that rlg seems to be a reliable gadget in that regard your friend says no i don't think you should go get an rlg laptop why look at the reason because a friend of his bought one a month ago to finish his master's thesis halfway through it smoke started pouring out of the cp <clears throat> he didn't get his thesis done hey so when this one got spot you couldn't use another laptop to finish your project hmm? you couldn't finish his thesis now he has lost his financial aid and he's selling both fruit on this this is a coconut guy by it is a man he's a man coconut now he's even selling both food. What has he selling both food? Do you know that this is good me vanilla both food? It's it's beef loaf, eh? Just in case you don't speak the local balance, it's beef loaf. But in our balance, we say both food. He's selling it on the street. A master student because of ILG says bill, and it's fail. The, ma the machine's failure has made the master student now a both food seller. I mean. I mean, that's an that's a dramatic, vivid, you know, insufficient evidence. You are trying to make a case that overgeneralizes something based on just one instance you have. But there are lots of ILG laptops being used by many people. What causes the uh, CPUs smoke, smoking? Could it have been that the guy may have used another cable or it could even generally be a fault in that thing. It's one month. Why didn't go, he go for a warranty or something? These are all questions you can ask. Just one instance, you want to say RLG is not the best. And yet, you are dramatized that hey, it's not the best. So even your thesis is quite unfinished. You end up selling both photos. Just like that, my friend. That's drama. Vividness. Mm, that is misplaced. Unnecessary details. That is just supposedly adding to the evidence to make it look like you have given enough grounds why. Look at the conclusion. The lady said, hey, I guess I won't go with the RLG laptop then. That's all, uncritical. Small mind, she should ask pertinent questions. Okay, the RLG books are important, plenty in. So if this is your reasoning, it is like misplaced, it's like insufficient evidence one. The first one we did, hasty generalization, but this one even has a, another sickness to it, which is what? unnecessary emotional emphasis. This one has to do with the smoking. This is a positive emotion. He said, yes, I read a side of a cigarette pack about smoking being harmful to your health. I read it. That's the Surgeon General's opinion, him and all his statistics. But let me tell you about my uncle. Uncle Sam has smoked cigarettes for 40 years now, and he's never been sick a day in his life. He even won the Milo Marathon in his age group last year. You should have seen him running from Tomato Dance. He smoked a cigarette during the award ceremony. And he had a broad smile on his face. I was really proud. <laughs> I can still remember the cheering. Look at the conclusion. Cigarette smoking can't be as harmful as people say. That's what he wants to say. That's the conclusion. That cigarette smoking is not as harmful as, as is being presented by see the authority the surgeon general has an opinion about taking cigarettes and he has statistics figures that show that those who are smoking i just muted someone i may not mute you the next time please i may be forced to disable your mic so that we can have clarity people can hear okay so next time i will not disable uh, unmuted. This time I'm not muted. I will only disable it. All right. So he, well, I just show you what happens when when you say that 
Oh, my uncle Sam is an instance of, uh, you know, the fact that oh, we can we can smoke. I mean, that don't happen. All this is really, I say, it's not it should tell immediately that what the person is doing is the person is confusing at one instance. He's using that one instance to draw a general conclusion that it's okay to smoke cigarettes. Okay, but. That one instance and the pleasant effect it gave him or her does not support. The reason why you want to unmute your thing when I disable it, hey, when I mute you, then you need to unmute it again. Oh. All right. So that is the point with misplaced vividness. Here, the emotional impact about it is how that uncle. It's even winning awards while smoking. And he's over 40 years into the smoking and he's all chic and fine. That's the experience that the speaker has. One experience, or Uncle Sam's experience finished. He's even winning marathons or what have you in his old age. So what? So based on that one instance and the experience he has about that one instance, She's generalizing about all smoking, regardless of what even the expert says. The expert says in reference to statistics available to him. That was misplaced vividness. The next fallacy we look at, apart from unqualified appeal to authority or appealing to an unqualified authority, that was what we did first. We saw hasty generalization. We've just done misplaced vividness. They are all fallacies that are committed informally. Quest, uh, fallacy number four, genetic fallacy. You saw this one when we did causal reason. When we saw post hoc, ego propter hoc, confusing cause with effect, that's both causal, non causal. We saw confusing a correlation for causal connection. And we saw ignoring a common Ignoring, or sometimes we say overlooking a common underlying cause. And then the last one there was genetic fallacy. When you use the genesis, the source of a thing, to either accept it or reject it, you commit a genetic fallacy, the genesis of it. Okay, You are accepting it because of where it comes from. I gave a very long commentary on my DE, the, the session I had with the DE folks talking about how Ghana will just accept anything wholesale. Don't ask questions. Just because it came from so-and-so. Even as a nation, sometimes we do that. We have imported wholesale practices. We don't want to fine tune them for our purposes. Political you know, systems, sometimes uh, financial policies. They might not work if you borrow someone's dress or you, you buy a dress from the shop. You want to make sure it fits. There are places you may want to loosen up a bit because of the body you have. Others you may want to tighten up. You don't. You just don't take wholesale just because of where it is sourced from. That's my point. The genesis. Okay. The first example says the phone you are using was manufactured in China, so it must be a fake one. You see. You see the problem. It could come from China. It would be a mega, mega, mega quality phone. If you go to China and ask them to give you, produce a manufacturing company there to produce fake things for you, they will produce it for you. Ah, there is fresh tomatoes at the market and there is a more potato, the rotten one. Rotten one, three baskets for three cities. The fresh one, one basket, 100 cities. Then you go and buy the rotten one and come home and say that market, all the things that are rotten. <laughs> she doesn't know what you're going to do with the rotten one. Maybe you're going to use it to do poultry farm or something. And the more rotten it is, the better for your feet. Think about it. So don't say because of where it came from, you want to make another for rotten thing. Okay. But we are keen on that. So someone you hear, sometimes you hear, oh, this is Ghana made. Mm, I want something else, Ghana made. But if you are looking for original kente woven, which, which brand do you want? It's Ghana made. You want to import that? So the source of a thing in itself doesn't make it right or wrong, good or bad, acceptable or unacceptable. It is the quality of it. And so whenever people argue, look at the example to the new undergraduate system is a copy of the American 
university system. So it must be an improvement over what we had before. Look at that. Small, small brief. Always remember this thing app repeatedly mentioned in my sessions. I tell people, America runs a democracy that is classified as a world democracy. UK is also considered a world democracy, but one has a kingdom system added to what the parliamentary system. It is still a democracy. Government of the people, for the people, by the people. America will not shudder to think of a kingdom. <laughs> In addition, I mean, the other American president is a king. Hey, that won't work there. This, so you should understand. Yeah, they are both world-class democracies that people look up to. It means that it is possible for you to import something that is valuable, maybe the principles, but you know, fine tune it. I don't know how to say that in other in other ways. Let it work. Look at your system. You're a communal, you know, a society that is communally oriented. Mm -hmm. I'm not so keen on me, myself, and I, even our language doesn't encourage that. When you are speaking, you do I, I, I. People say, oh, why? It's like it's not modest. It's not, it's not appropriate to be speaking me, me, I, myself. In corporate settings, in, in shared settings. I should tell you that when you pick a ballot box oriented kind of voting system, it might not seem to work. Look at Africa alone. How many coups in this 21st century we are still recording? <laughs> is it that the people there are like uh, they don't understand? No, 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 no. Maybe, maybe there is a problem that a critical mind must look at. If the people don't associate with it, you can't force it down their throat. A person doesn't chew grass. What they eat is a bar and a goosey stew proper. With meat, you have gone to bring a coffee and uh, what is the other one? <laughs> As a breakfast. The person doesn't see that they eat. Look at that, a typical Asante. Mother-in-law, who has come to visit you. In breakfast, you give her a sandwich and sausage. Lunch, you said uh, you do pineapple upside down. I mean, she will tell you she hasn't eaten since she came. One week, name in the Because she's looking for fufu tum, 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 tum in Africa. You know, not even the one that you stay in a portal, where you stay Fufu, that bamboo fufu thing, no, you have to pound it, let the sound and the sweat and everything, and, uh -huh, and then mold it and put the precursor inside. I'm just using all that to show you that it's still eating food, but it has to have a local coloration. So when you are adopting and importing economic ideas, eh, political ideas, sociology, we people, eh, psycho people, the thinking and everything must be customized. It doesn't mean you can't take from somewhere else. We don't live in societies that, that are not interconnected. We live in a society that is interconnected. So we may be in Ghana, but we can be relating with a uh, non, non, non ghanaian audience. So it is very important to allow for intercultural or if you like multicultural ideas, no problem with that. But when you adopt, for instance, wearing high heels, Remember, you have gravels here. So what will work, high heels or clogs may work for someone walking in snow. You don't walk in snow here. Uh-huh, I'm speaking figuratively. So when you go and bring it wholesale, you are adopting and you are using it, your walking will change. It will look like you are not a decent girl because your body will be shaking, blah, 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 blah. Because it's high heel in, in gravels. And maybe if you put down the high heel or you cut down the heel a little, then your glory will emanate. You will have a, that elegance that a woman should have. And you will walk decently. People will say, ah, this girl doesn't know how to walk ah, in that. You say, she doesn't know how to walk. It's not you don't know how to walk. It's a shoe. But perhaps if you wore your ahenema, the flat sandals, I'm speaking figuratively, we learned metaphors. So if our system, our politics, for instance, would, would be accustomed to us, it would be something that we can associate, we are consensual in our approach. So instead of 
ballot box and what have you after we do the ballot box can we have a consensual posture you know that is the typical african thing to a large extent it will have its problems but we evolve it not 50 plus one so you can say what you like i'm the one sitting on the throne for four years when i think hey, that's why people can't wait for the four years they can't it's not in the person it is in our systems so why am i saying all this genesis when we go important or when we have a certain thinking about the source of a thing oh this baby food came from so and so place so it is the ish when your wound perhaps look her greenish tom brown what have you would have been more nutritious more fresh and suitable to our climatic conditions alone don't go beyond the climate but it came from so and so place so and when because of that, it is acceptable. Or it came from so and so and so. Just because of that, it is not acceptable. That is a sick thinking. And we, do, we want the critical thinker to be aware of that. See how much I elaborated on that? Because I could ask you, for instance, to give three practical illustrations in very simple statement to show how genetic fallacy could affect our politics, how genetic fallacy could affect our economic systems, how genetic fallacy could affect our legal systems. How can we have a law that punishes in such a way? For example, I don't know any such law, but suppose we had a law that says if the mother misbehaves, uh, uh, punish the mother by what? Putting her into this. When the mother is a breastfeeding mother, you see, how can it be legal for two people to go and stand somewhere and say we have become husband and wife? Our witness is one person, not in an African setting. It will wash. African setting allows a place for chiefs and chief tenancy and what we call the customary laws because of the emphasis that people make or have, the connection they have to chiefship. Hmm? The chief says that I like me, I like no one is going nowhere till tomorrow. See how the people themselves went will ensure that that happens. And then let us hear it coming from Abain. <laughs> you know, and see, just look at the posture. That is more than enough to tell you. There is not something you can go and import wholesale legal systems without watching how the sociocultural system goes. This information I'm giving you on elaboration will help social people, will help psycho people, will help social work, will help information studies, will help law students, political scientists. When you are making policies, you don't say you leave it, then we are going. The people don't care about what the intentions are. You have to watch how they interpret that. And some might think of that as insensitivity. Some might think that these people are just, you say, no, we can't import uh, used products again, which is fine. The policy might be right, but look at the social cultural system and then mitigate it. And then we are de developing a crap, or they are developing so and so needs to all the people who live here. Yeah, you don't, you don't do that. Okay, anyway, let's continue. So I use all those to help you see genetic fallacy. There are some more examples here. We'll see, when you read, then you use them. Pseudo precision, the next one. Let me have someone else read, apart from Priscilla. If you want to read, please raise your hand. Priscilla, read whilst we, we find someone else for the next. Yeah, very good. I see Amedeka, I see Frederick, Ahuni, I see Magdalene. Okay, let me take Frederick then. Go ahead, Frederick. Frederick, please read for us. Frederick Ahuni. Misplaced precision. Mathematical mystification. Exact statistical figures are used to characterize notions that can be expressed in exact or numerical terms. Mm -hmm. The application of figures to indicate precise quantities where, where to date, no measurement can be feasibly expected. This is often done to all or impress people with numbers. Very good. So here, look at the name there. This is a little technical, not difficult, but it's not straightforward. So watch. Pseudo. Precision. We saw the word pseudo earlier, pretending to be. So it is not real, it's false. That's why it's also called false precision. Okay. 
it is over precision. You are going beyond what you can do. You can't be precise about that, that kind of concept, but you are pretending as if you can. It is, you are, you are, you are, you are trying to be precise as going over the bar, sort of, okay? You are using math. That's the one that interests me, mathematical mystification. You are using the math to mystify us, sort of. We bring you so, you know. You are unifying us with the mass. It's like you want to use the mass as a tool to uh, put some, I don't say fear, but make us all shut up, sort of, because mathematical figures have come in. But what is the query we have? You are trying to be precise. Precision means exact. You are presenting yourself as being exact, very detailed to the point. How are you doing that? You are using the mathematical figures to do that. But the query the critical mind is raising is, this notion that you are trying to be precise about cannot be measured in book. It's not measurable. It's indeterminate. Remember vagueness, unit three. When we did equivocation and we did ambiguity, we looked at the third concept, vagueness. When we said metaphorical statement or met metaphors are intentionally vague and purposefully vague. So that one, we don't critique it. But when we speak and we say, oh, democracy, for example, is freedom for all. That was in definitions. We critique that. You can't define democracy as freedom for all. what is freedom. Everybody doing what they like. That's what democracy should mean. Every human being, animals are included. The human beings are terrorists also free to do what they like. When we are voting, then Togo people can come and then uh, Ghana people too can go to Togo and vote. Freedom. What is what sense of freedom? The ability to do what you like. <coughs> Go snapping pictures at the uh, plaster house. Visit Nanado in his home and say that, oh, today is food for yam. So we want them to cook yam. Feel free. <laughs> we critique the other and say, it can't be correct. It's so vague. It, it's not specific. What do you mean when you say freedom for all? All what? Then the freedom to, which sense of freedom? So who do you have in mind when you say democracy is essence? So we saw that in definitions, unit two. Then in unit three, we took it proper and showed you when you are vague, it means there is no specificity. You can't measure. Behold, I come soon. And that was 2023 years ago. And it is still soon. <laughs> Intentionally vague. So that if you should name people like you and I, will not wait when we hear that. The man is coming. Ampana, then we all go and clean our houses and look all holy. Behold, I am coming soon, said Jesus. 2,203 years ago, we are told. He hasn't come yet. Because of the dust expression, soon hasn't been falsified. Soon is soon. So I told you, I don't know if you remember, you know, interactions in that, and said, if you are in a relationship and you ask the guy, oh, it looks like the family is getting a bit concerned. When do you think we'll normalize our relationship and formalize it? I mean, when do you want to go and do the bride, bride stuff? And if the guy tells you, oh, don't worry, we'll do it soon. Tell him, I beg you, soon, party. <laughs> it doesn't help me. Let's have some plan. Let's lay, lay out something. Maybe after, after so and so and so. Let's get so and so and so so that we use so and so to, to, to do this. But soon is one minute from now or 100 million years from now. It's still soon. Any moment from now, it's like that. So, when should we come for our passport? Doc, please, when should we come for our results? If I told you soon and you really, unless, of course, I, I was maybe the soon will mean uh, soon can go beyond the end of the semester. But if you're a critical mind, you have to respectfully say, Doc, please, if you could just put some, some timelines to it to help me. You want to enter the office? Please, uh, oh, the HOD is busy. Should I wait? Or I should go and come? You say, oh, don't worry, we'll finish soon. <laughs> it can be till close of day if the meeting trails. Because soon day, the secretary hasn't gone bad when she's told you soon. Soon can be right after you step down since the, the people can come out. Or soon can be forever. The point then is, I, I went to do that revision because I want you to get 
misplaced vividness at one touch. I don't want you to struggle when we add semi attached figures. So, watch. When, therefore, you are dealing with a concept like this one, which concept? The one we have called vague. We are dealing with a vague concept. And you want to, you say you have done a research that shows you that a certain number of people, so let's say 60.6 percent of people have done this example. I found it now, very good. In a recent two years survey, look on my screen, please. 75.38% of students at the University of Ghana were discovered to be spiritually motivated. So we can confidently suppose that over three quarters of Legon students on campus today are spiritually motivated. The argument is we have tested we have done some research work and we found that 75.38% of students are spiritually motivated. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, how do you measure spiritual motivation for you to go and get 75.38% of them being spiritual? What is the standard for measuring spiritual motivation? That is the query. So don't come and use 7.538 beer to scare us to give us an impression to all us that, oh, really? No. The concept you are talking about is not the weight of people or the height of people that you can easily count or measure and say, oh, 75.38% of Legon students have weights be, uh, beyond what? 75 pounds. That is measurable. It will not commit to this fallacy we are raising. But when you are using the figure to qualify, my dear student, a concept or a notion, back to the slide, see, a concept or a notion that cannot be expressed in exact or numerical terms. How do you measure spiritual motivation? How do you measure whether people were motivated spiritually to do what they are doing? Is it the tongues that they are speaking, how loud it is or how low it is? Is it the way they dance? how they are giving a church or something. Oh, but people do all that because of that address lake queen girl at the back there. That's why he has come to the church. When he gets address lake queen, he will not do that again. So it's not a spiritual matter. But some too will not do anything that you would have counted as spiritual. But they are rather inspired by the spiritual. How, what is the measuring fact? I said spiritual motivation. Is it like a BP? that you can check with the, uh, and then you know this, the, what is it, the historic end. <laughs> it is not something, look on my screen, please, point one. You are just pretending to have exact, there we go, statistical figures that are used. You are using it to characterize a notion, a concept that cannot, that, that, that notion or concept eh, cannot be expressed in exact or numerical terms, it can't. Yet you have put the figure there, according to your own research. What did the people go to the field to go and investigate? How did they measure it? What they are measuring is vague. So the starting point is the problem. Don't bring mathematical figures to come and impress us. We are not impressed. Go and clarify the concept, put measurable things there. Then when you finish and you do your analysis, it will wash for the critical <laughs> The application of figures, the second point now on your screen, to indicate precise quantities where up to date, no measurement can be what feasibly expected. We don't expect that there can be something that measures spiritual motivation. It is not height. That is why those who are spiritual folks and like church and mosque and you know any believe in the religious eh? you know that god says he looks at the heart it doesn't mean the body doesn't matter so go and wear skimpy clothing and say god looks at the heart no the, if the heart is right it will show in the body mm? it will show in the personality and all those ones but the reason is sometimes even the giving the person is giving is because he or she wants to be seen why did Jesus say the, the widow's might? The widow was the one who gave the biggest. 
because she didn't have anything left. All she had is what she gave, the coin. Others maybe give 10,000, 20,000, but they have 3 billion left at home. So you are looking at the 10,000, which is big sitting there, which is fine. It helps to solve problems. But the one who sees and can measure mm, infinity to infinity, the one who is determining what is you say, let don't do the judgment. Let me do the judgment. Do you know why he's a chief judge? Yeah. So chill. Help each other, bear each other up. That's what we are admonished to do. When I think that ah, the way you are going there, it might not it might, it might, it might. Eh? So I help you. Not that I judge you. Because the one who is the chief judge, who knows all the nooks and cronies of the matter, is the one who can tell the heart. There are people who are thieves because they are helpless. I'm telling you, they are thieves because they are helpless. It doesn't justify the action, but they need help. So if help comes, they will not see. Okay? So we, we should let... The chief just do that. I, I just said that because of the spiritual motivation, how we are critic. You can't measure that. That's the second point. And then the third one, still emphasizing what pseudo precision is. is this is often done to ow oh, or impress people with numbers. As soon as we see 60.66% of so and so and so, we don't even look at what the, the notion is that the 60.66 is trying to qualify. We just get carried away. Hey, 60 point this day is more than half full. Hey, you have to be a little boy. What is the concept? Which concept is that? If it is not a measurable concept, and yet some people say they've done a research and they are putting figures that they claim their research shows, we are telling them that the starting point is the problem. When you went to the field to measure this thing, where which part of it is measurable? So the science-oriented folk, social studies, uh, sociology, psychology, uh, what uh, linguistics, so that we go to the field to gather data, watch, so that you don't fall, you know, into the trap of what you do. Precision. The last one. Semi-attached figure. Let me take. Stacy, America. Stacy, read for me. Thank you, my brother. Stacy, <clears throat> read what you share on screen. Let me attach a figure. A statistic figure or figure attached to a conclusion that is irrelevant to the attributes featured in the conclusion or indirectly related to it. When the sample is not relevant to the hypothesis, the figure provided may just be attached related to the hypothesis. This is done to deflect attention to the subject matter and creates the impression that the conclusion has been meticulously researched. Well done. Don't get, don't confuse the two. Pseudo precision, we have just seen that it is the figure attached to a certain concept. That concept, we are not sure how you even measured it at all to come and tell us that your measurement generated. 97.99 percent that's the problem we have because the concept you are trying to measure is not measurable it's vague it can mean several things to different people so if you go to the field to measure it it means you went with a certain either you went with your own conception of spiritual motivation that others may not share that is why we will call it out and say that it was what a pseudo precision. You are pretending to be precise about something that is not precise. But for semi-attached figure, your research, the evidence you are proffering, is very much connected to the conclusion. There is no, uh, I'm sorry, I said it's very micro. There is no um, um, vagueness with any concept. It is not a matter of the concept not being measurable. No, it is very measurable. That's the first thing. You have measured. That's the second thing. The figures you have introduced are correct after your measurement. That's the third one. What problem do we have with it? Well, even after all this has been said, the research, the evidence you have provided is not relevant to the conclusion you are trying to do. It is not leading you to the conclusion. Is totally diverting our attention. It is not relevant to the conclusion you want to draw. And found 
So even if we accepted the whole set of premises, which has the numbers there, has the figures in it, it has the statistics in it, mm -hmm. we accepted it. That statistic and that research you have there doesn't lead us to the conclusion. It's irrelevant to it. Look at the example, typical one. They help you understand. If you want to sell your alcoholic drink as a cure for COVID-19, but you can't actually prove that it works, then simply publish your laboratory report demonstrating that, watch, half an ounce of your drink killed 99% of germs in a test tube in under seven seconds. Now, all you need is a photo of a handsome doctor and your advertisement is ready to go. <laughs> See the premise. So you would say, if you do this, then you commit to the fallacy that we are talking about, semi-attached. What is that fallacy? My alcoholic drink, and it happened when COVID came with the sanitizers. You see that this, my sanitizer, has 99% potency of killing germs. Look at the evidence. If you like pour it in the test tube that have those germs in it, they will all die in seven seconds. So the figure is 99%. And when you see that, my dear sisters and brothers in the law, sometimes you don't even look at the product. Look at the percentage and you say, wow, then I want that. But remember, it kills germs. The conclusion that has been drawn is therefore it will kill COVID-19. That's the semi attached figure fallacy. The thing can kill 99% of germs in a test tube under seven seconds doesn't mean, therefore, there comes the conclusion, therefore, it kills COVID-19 infection or whatever. You see that the 99.999% is what will lure the unsuspecting or critical mind to just go get the product. But the figure is not fully attached to the conclusion I'm drawing. The 99.9% .9 is attached to germs, not to COVID-19. So it comes as a premise that has the figure, 99.9% .9 germs died with my product. My product, you see, Miles's hand sanitizer or something. This Miles's hand sanitizer killed 99.9% .9 germs. COVID is in trouble, full stop, maybe. <laughs> That's a nice advert, people will go buy it. And, and uh, whatever, if you are not careful, the Food and Drugs Authority cannot do anything, look at how the advert was presented. This, my, my vaccine, uh, excuse me, this my hand sanitizer killed 99.9% .9 germs. It's true, it did. So the premise is true. Then I could conclude COVID-19 germs to will be in trouble. I have not said this thing will kill it, but you see how I can get people to come and buy this product of mine. It is the figure that is creating the impression, the math, the, the mathematical figure, 99.9%. When you hear you say, hey, I said me, Nancy, I did some. I told your, your, your colleagues yesterday, when COVID came fresh and everybody was stressed out 2020. Children are going to school, you know, you are worried. So you went, I went to the pharmacy, I was looking for uh, sanitizers that work, that can kill them. <laughs> the germs, I want bazooka. Oh, whatever, I look at it, this is 99%, this 99%, is very good, I want that one. I want that, I want four of them for the little ones. Then two for myself and senior Johnny Bravo. You know, quick, 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 I went to collect it, my sister. 99.99% it is for James. That's the premise. The conclusion that therefore it will kill COVID-19 uh, 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 James is not necessarily connected to this. This one kills all James. COVID-19 was a special type of James. Special type. But the premise with the figure in it, that's why we call it a semi-attached because the marks that makes people look at it without 
talking. Look at the second one, you have 75 percent of oh, yeah, 75, it is a big number. Oh, really? They are not questioning anything. Here, even if you accepted the premise to be true, it is irrelevant to the conclusion. But if you're not careful, that premise will lead a lot of people to assume that the conclusion that COVID-19 uh, will also die, COVID-19 germs will also die by die alcoholism. They will take it for granted. They will even query the relevance of that statistical figure in that premise to the conclusion being drawn. So the figure is not fully attached. It is partially attached because it is true that the, the whatever, the drink kills what, 99% of germs. That's true. So if you went to test it at the lab, it will be true. But the conclusion is what is this thing is not attached to. So it is partially attached. The research is showing a semi-attached figure. It is attached to the premise, but it doesn't lead you to the hypothesis, the conclusion. So it's not attached to the conclusion. That is semi-attached figure. What should you know, in addition to all that we've said, know that one passage could commit more than one flaw, one error, one fallacy. It isn't always one fallacy in one passage. Just like one patient in front of the physician could be suffering from anemia, jaundice, constipation, loss of appetite. This is what I'm doing, one person all in one. So one person could be appealing to pity at the same time, appealing to or attacking the person. One passage on your screen that's what is happening here. Could be appealing to the masses, what plenty of people say, and yet invoking pity in those he or she's hearing. One passage on your screen now could be appealing to threat. I'll be threatening you, appealing to the people, and yet generalizing the his. This is interesting. Look at it. Honey, either you buy me that five carat emerald ring, or I'll have nothing to wear on this awfully bare finger. <laughs> you do want to make me happy, don't you? Give me that ring and I will love you for life. That's threats. That's appeal to threat already. It means don't give me that ring and you won't have my love for life. Every good husband buys their wife's emerald rings. That's appealing to the people. Every good husband. Yes, I look at my friend Akos. <laughs> From Akos. She's going to talk about everyone, hasty generalization. She's very happy now that her husband bought her the ring. I can even see a, a ad hominem eulogistic as well. She's very happy now that her husband bought her the ring. And Sewa too. You see, from Akos and Sewa, you see, conclusion. I'm unhappy, generalization. From two women, she's, she's going to talk about wives. But there is Nancy too here. I may not have an emerald ring. <laughs> but I'm happy. Or, or we don't know if we are happy. <laughs> you see, wives become unhappy because their husbands refuse to buy them emerald rings. You see the threat? You see the people? You see the hasty generalization. That's the point. When you read them, you see. Then they, do you want us to read the other ones? You say it's wrong for me to download music from the net without paying for it. That's crazy. Everybody's doing it. Appeal to uh, the masses. Everybody's appealing to the people. Mm -hmm. You know what's really wrong? It's all these people who are being prosecuted for stealing from the electronic store. These innocent women, there we go, the pity. They are innocent. Are uh, living difficult lives and sometimes they barely make things. So you should go and steal. Huh? How do you expect them to buy Boba for? So they should go and steal. No. So the stealing is not justified. Don't invoke pity there. Okay? As if they are sitting by the roadside or they are not, they don't have a place to sleep and you were talking about it, it's fine. But they are stealing. You, say, you know what's really wrong? It's all these Kayaye who are being prosecuted for stealing from the electronic store. Ah, but if they steal, shouldn't they be prosecuted? That's the point. So if you move from there and come and talk about how they are innocent and they are blah, blah, this is pity. You are invoking pity. You are, you are stopping to deal with the issue. You want people to find their situation pathetic. But I tell you, you can't justify the situation. Then beg rather, beg for food. That one doesn't offend anybody in the system legally. Hmm? 
than going to steal because you say you are hungry. Okay. And then the brothers will also steal things because they are hungry somewhere. They are hungry below their belt. They will feel free to steal. You have to be careful what you call a principle. Okay, then the terrorists who attack the World Trade Center really shouldn't be blamed for their actions. Where they go again? <laughs> they came from poor, struggling families oppressed by religion. Right. You argue that terrorists should be punished, but you are always you you've always been a mean-spirited, stingy guy with no sympathy for anyone. You reality. There's ad hominem, there's logistic, there's appeal to pity, and, and there, there are several others I think I can pull out. Maybe and, and so on. So conclusion, conclusion, a critical thinker will not be duped if armed with an awareness of the different ways there are to provide a motivation to believe a conclusion instead of being provided good logical reasons to believe that conclusion. See, one is motivation. Motivation there is, then it comes out again. Motivation, you don't be motivated to give. It's not motivation that makes you do. When you are always depending on motivation, be exalted to give. They are different. Be, be led to give. Because, <laughs> you know, let's talk about something else. Look at what we put there. But rather be provided with good logical reasons. God says, hey, come, let us reason together. If your sin is as red as scarlet, I'll make it as white as snow. Come and put the Branian system. Come and let's argue. When you present, I present. Not exchange of words. No. You come, yes, I told you this. <laughs> but you, that's what God Adam to, to do when he came and Adam had messed up. He said, Adam, where are you? Adam said, I'm naked. Ah, where are you? He said, I'm naked. <laughs> where are you? So I'm under the tree here. Then we can ask you some further questions. Adam, where are you? He said, I'm naked. He wanted to engage, so he said, ah, have you eaten the food that I said you should eat? Why was God doing that? I'm referencing the Bible, eh, just in case you don't know. You can, can Google it and find Genesis something. Genesis says, hmm? have you eaten what I said you should eat? So that the guy can give reason, because he could have determined what, where the discussion would be, what our fate would have been. The guy don't want, doesn't want to engage Rational reflection. No. It is the woman who brought emotions, judgment, not engaging. Understand that the responsibility was placed in your hands. So if a leader, you take responsibility for actions. Take it. Not just be. Take it. No, don't, don't just be responsible. Take responsibility. So you went into the washroom. You wanted to go and use the place. When you entered, someone had messed the place up. Sorry. You are stepping out. After all, you didn't do it. But when you step out and the next person coming after you goes there, the person will say, you did it. So it is your responsibility now to ensure that what was created there is cleared. You have to take that responsibility. I mean, I didn't throw the thing there. When I came, the water has spilled away. Hey, it's not me, hey. But you are a human being working there. So even if you may not have the time or you are not able to mop it, it is your responsibility to tell the next person or the cleaner or something, oh, there's, I think water has spilled. I'm going for a lecture. Can you help us clean that? You have done yours. We are all entering out of a lecture hall. The, the door or the gate, whatever, I think it should be a door that we are stepping out to. Has three or maybe sometimes two openings. One is closed. The other one that is open to is just partially opened and 600 students are trying to work out. Nobody will take responsibility and open this door, people. Sometimes I am amazed though. Then people will be squeezing their They are all in a hurry to go to the next lecture. And they have 10 minutes. Sometimes the lecture may have even used few. So it's, it's left with five minutes for 600, 500, 300 students to get through that door. Nobody feels a sense of responsibility, open the door and step out. Open it, then we, we about seven of us can go out at a time. Before long, we are all dispersed. Logical reasons. It's not because you want to say you, you are the, the, what, the subordinate and someone is the boss. No, the reasoning is correct. If I open it, 
more of us can go out at a time. Someone who have the his or her phone pulled out of her pocket because of the inconvenience and the stress and the pushing or what have you. Before you know it, someone's wig. And uh, ladies, your wig cap will be off, lying on the floor. Embarrassment because of the struggle. If someone can just reason, reflectively think that this one can be done this way. If we went this way, he says, as I say, oh, hold on, please. Let me open the door. And then for a temporary five seconds or so, you pull the lock up, you pull this one and open the door. Wider fresh air, you move out freely. You don't lose your stuff like that. Come, let us reason. Nanka will not be under a case. But the guy passes it on to the woman. When they ask the woman to give you say, ask the, ask the snake, it's not me. Then we go to the snake. The snake said nothing. So he took an authority that you should have had. The point I'm making is reasoning helps you. So if it is something that is inspired by reason, reason, then when you finish making that decision, you will stand by it because you thought through it. It's not emotions or persuasion. Mm? or the one that we learned the, the, the last day, psychological inducement. You finish and say, yay, I've left a good guy. I'm going for this Johnny Bravo. It's not giving me peace at all. Because what was given to you was a motivation. You didn't think through. You didn't reflectively make a decision. And that is what I want us to be minded about. So our colleague says, Always make sure that the beliefs, the language, the statistical manipulations, fear, emotions, personal biases do not obstruct your view when you are making logical, rational decisions as a critical thinker. We are done. Just want to chip it that in on the recording that. If you are a person of faith, after you've done all these reflections, it cannot be without the supernatural hand that we believe in. And so you do that knowing that that hand would always ultimately determine how it turns out. I end the recording now and take your questions. Any questions? <laughs>